Good afternoon and welcome to the first ELECTS webinar of the 2012-2013 season. I'm Pamela Blue, past chair of the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee. Joining me as host of today's session is Maria Pincus, a member of the 2012-2013 CE Committee. We are delighted to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Walter Nelson. Walter works for the RAND Corporation, a nonprofit institution dedicated to improving policy and decision making through research and analysis. Walter specializes in the deployment of web interfaces, catalogs, and digital content management systems and has more than 25 years of experience as a webmaster and systems administrator at the RAND Library. Walter's familiarity with tools such as Circe Symphony, EOS, FileMaker, and Drupal make him uniquely qualified to inquire into the future of the integrated library system. In his free time, Walter is active with the historical dance community in Southern California, where he has organized events such as the Avalon Ball, a 1930s big band dance held at the Avalon Ballroom on Catalina, and the Jane Austen Evening, a program of entertainments and dance from the Jane Austen era. Walter's goal in his activities at RAND, as well as externally, is to obtain the greatest impact from online tools with the most efficient possible application of time and effort. GoToWebinar does not have an interactive chat capability, but if you wish to comment on today's session while it is in progress, you may use the Twitter back channel hashtag on the screen. Walter is prepared to respond to questions at several points during his presentation, so please use the question box on your screen to submit questions at any time. There will also be a time at the conclusion of the presentation for additional questions. Any questions which could not be answered while we are on the air will be answered offline and the responses sent to all attendees. Today's session will be recorded and you will receive a link to the recording at the conclusion of the webinar together with a copy of Walter's slides. Now, as I turn the presentation over to Walter, there may be a slight delay. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, this is Walter Nelson, and I'm going to be speaking on the future of the integrated library system, question mark. And I'd like to thank the Association for Library Collection and Technical Services for uh, sponsoring this presentation. Uh, as mentioned, there will be a couple of breaks in my presentation for uh, questions, and, um, and um, well, I guess I will just go into it. This is about prognostication. Now, I don't know the future of the integrated library system, but of course that won't stop me from making predictions. I predict if we continue with the status quo, the integrated library system has no future. And I predict that if we free the integrated library system from its current constraints, it will be free to evolve and perhaps survive. Now, Tales of OPAC's past, and I'm afraid, many cases, present. The OPAC, the traditional online public access catalog portion of the integrated library system. The OPAC is a destination. It's a place on the, in the digital universe. It has a distinct identity, and of course, we librarians feel compelled to assign it a whimsical name. It is the digital equivalent of the card catalog room. We go down the digital stairs into the digital basement, and there we find the digital card catalog. The information has to be gone to, and it doesn't come to your customers. This is, of course, all tied to the sense of library as place, the catalog as place, is part of the place uh, that is the library. It's where the physical books, the paper journals live. It's also where the librarians reside. And libraries, as we know, are not the places they used to be. 
Now, integrated library systems are very good at what they were designed to do, which is books. Catalog records are the digital analog of card catalog cards. And so they're very good at physical monographs, at telling you what books do you have, who has them checked out, when are they due, and so on. It's not as good at journals because people don't want to know about just journal titles. They are interested in the full text of articles, and ILSs don't really do that. ILSs are not really great at digital content. They, they can manage with links and so forth, but that's not what they're really optimized for. And the reality is that in today's world, most content, that you, most research content resides outside your integrated library system. Though there are many of you out there who are importing vast quantities of it as an afterthought. Now, an integrated library system. Integrated in the original sense is that the integrated library system talks to itself. It's inward facing. It's, this integration is an artifact of the pre-internet days, back when the catalog existed in splendid isolation on the library server and was accessed from dark terminals within the library building or perhaps somewhere else on the campus. Um, but in 2012, in the age of the internet, integration means something else. It means the ability to integrate with the rest of the library, with the rest of the enterprise's website, with other data sources, with aggregators, with discovery tools. And it could even, since you have people and money as part of what you're doing, it should be able to integrate with your HR and your accounting and purchasing systems. It should smoothly integrate with your communications and feedback and social networking systems. Now, the fallacy of this kind of integration is that you have within your integrated library system multiple systems, modules, that do purchasing or circulation or serials or search, and they're all tied together within the catalog. And each piece has very different requirements, and none of them are really the best of breed, because they, like SharePoint, are a system that tries to do everything and therefore does nothing really well. And now, a few questions for you. User experience. Do your customers, or your own staff for that matter, prefer your OPAC to Google and other things, other search tools? And does the design of your OPAC meet current user experience standards? And can it be easily modified as standards in your organization evolve? Is it the go-to system? Is it the first place your customers look when they have, a, uh, have an information need? Is it the first place you look when you are presented with a new knowledge management challenge, is it ever the best tool for the job? And in fact, does it even talk to the best tool for the job, whatever that might be? And now integration. Does your OPAC look and feel anything like your website? Or does it have a distinct look and feel, a distinct branding, that is unlike anything else you do? Does the content in your integrated library system display anywhere else on your website? Do you use modules like serials and acquisition as they were designed, as they were intended, or do you use spreadsheets and personal databases, and access or something, or post-it notes or anything like that to get your real work done? And does your ILS interact well with systems outside the ILS? Does it talk to the rest of the network and its various systems? And now the key question, relevance. Is your OPAC increasing or decreasing in relevance to your users? And can you foresee a future where the cost of the ILS 
<clears throat> is greater than its relevance, and might you be there already? But if it did more useful stuff, might you might it be more relevant? And it really, of course, comes down to return on investment. Is it the best use of your limited budget? And most of us have limited budgets. And think for a moment, what if you had all that money you're spending on your ILS? What else would you spend it on? And then, of course, we're dealing with perception. Do your funders, who may not actually be your actual customers, do they understand that your library is more than just your catalog? Uh, this is something that I know I encounter constantly, is people outside the library, when they want to link to the library, they link to the catalog. Now, if those people who are holding the, your purse strings decide that your catalog is irrelevant, will that mean that they feel you are irrelevant, and will your ILS be an anchor that drags your library down with it. Of course, this depends on where you are. Um, the first time I gave this, one of my co-presenters was in academia, and he was very sanguine that integrated library systems were here to stay, uh, because in academia, traditional libraries are here to stay, or at least they seem that way at the moment. But that is not necessarily the case everywhere. In public uh, libraries and in, in uh, primary and secondary school libraries, shrinking budgets are putting the libraries themselves in danger along with their integrated library systems. And in my world, in corporations, agencies, law firms, and so forth, in the special libraries world, special libraries are disappearing every day. Okay? In order to survive, we need to provide a value proposition. We need to be able to say why we are worth the money. And the same old, well, libraries are important, libraries matter, kind of arguments are wearing thin. And if we make an argument about why we are useful, and at the center point of that is a traditional ILS with its bibliographic records or the books on the shelf, we have got a real problem. OK, I will pause for a moment for questions. I will entertain anything but should we just give up and go home questions because the answer is no and that's the next thing I'll talk about. So I'm opening up to questions. Walter, there are no questions at the moment but I would like to ask one thing and that is you mentioned something called UX um, and you said that was the user experience standard and I wondered if that is a real standard or if that's just terminology. Uh, it is not a single standard. It is, it is something that each individual organization sets. They define their own and user experience. Um, and, and generally, an organization will have standards within itself. And my point was that the library system is generally not aligned with the standard, the user experience standards of uh, the organization that owns or is hosting that library system. Okay, thank you. The, right, there are no wait. questions at the moment, but please yeah. um, send your questions in. Oh, wait a minute, there is a question. Let me see. Okay. Um, yes, there are. They people are just sending them. Uh, let me just get a hold of this quickly. Um, how can academics assume the traditional library is safe? yet still pursue institutional repositories as a way to secure their relevance. Is this in the face of the assumption? Um, I don't want to really address the management of academic libraries because it's something, um, because I am, I am merely an observer and uh, can't really, uh, I, don't, I don't feel like I should, uh, I, I should get into that. And one other quick question, will you be talking about discovery layers more extensively? Uh, I'm sorry, you, you broke up there. Oh, will you be talking about discovery layers? Uh, I will not go into, into uh, considerable detail. Um, I'm really talking in terms, uh, but I, I, will, I will address them in general terms. Good, okay. So we'll continue with the presentation then. All right, thank you. Okay, now I've been talking about doom. Let's talk about hope. 
Okay, what are we good at? These we we who have catalogs. Catalogs are good at clean data with consistent standards. That's assuming you're doing it right. It's where the good data live. And of course, good catalogers equal good data. Um, I, I would uh, make an aside that data standards must evolve to fit current information needs, but, uh, but that is an extremely complicated issue that we don't have time to get into just now. It also can be rather contentious. Uh, but the key here is that catalogs are a repository of something that is actually amazingly rare and precious, and that is consistency of metadata. And that is, um, that is something that, uh, that the library can provide that is, that is, as I said, amazingly hard to find out there. And here's an instructive example. Um, within the RAND Corporation, we needed metadata about our own work, the thousands of documents that RAND has produced since 1947, and we needed this information to populate our internal and our external websites. Uh, they tried for two years to make the data from the publications database uh, do this. And it failed because it was sloppy and inconsistent. It was built to meet the short-term needs of publishing and, and had nothing and was not addressing the long-term needs of uh, um, uh, the long-term needs of data management. And of course it had been uh, going on for uh, 50 years and therefore had many different iterations of what was considered useful. So attempts to use it, failed miserably. And of course, we the library are always the last place people go, but they eventually came to us. And we saved the project um, because for many years we in the library had been taking that data that we'd gotten from the publications department and we'd been cleaning it up and incorporating it into our catalog. We were assigning consistent standards and taxonomy and uh, the biggest challenge was we had been uh, setting up consistent author naming conventions. And this had always been a problem because the authors had not necessarily called themselves the same thing on every single document. Um, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, military aviators here at the RAND Corporation. Every one of them has a nickname, you know, Punch or Sparky or something like that, which somehow would find its way into a lot of things. Um, so the, uh, anyway, this was uh, one of the greatest contributions we made, is that we had clearly defined, delineated, and deduped our authors. So we extracted this data with considerable difficulty from uh, the system we were using at the time, which was Circe, and we, um, we pulled the data out as text, then we used a different program to, re, uh, to, to uh, reformat it as XML, and then another program to upload the XML into the, the various methods we were using on the internal and external websites for presenting data. Um, it was very slow, it was ponderous, but it was a success. And the end result was, and still is, extremely useful. So the moral of the story is the information was there. It was in the integrated library system, but it was useless hiding in there. We couldn't tell people, go search the OPAC. It was only useful when we exported it. And exporting and repurposing it required extensive programming and multiple skill sets. And it was valuable because it was clean. It conformed to stand to consistent library standards. Now, when I saw this, I was very enthusiastic because I, w I thought that I'd be able to use this as the core for using the, the ILS as something of a content management system for the website, but there was no money to do it for anything but our own publications, and so I was not able to pursue it further and expand on this program. 
but there is an excellent example of what happens when the money is there, and that is Boeing aircraft. And I found out about this at the last Internet Librarian Conference. Uh, the Boeing uh, Aircraft Corporation needed a corporate knowledge management solution. And they had innovative interfaces, integrated library system, and they simply attached to that an enormous outlay of resources, money and personnel and expertise. And what they ended up with was an enterprise-wide knowledge management system. And this, I think, is a major, this is a really big deal. Because what this means is that within Boeing, at least, the library is the knowledge manager. They have reinvented themselves. They have moved beyond being the keeper of dusty books um, and people's minds to being the being perceived as the as the lords of information organization and that is an essential role that is a role that ensures the survival of the library as an organization and of the ILS as it has been massively reinvented um, by Boeing Unfortunately, most of us don't have the kind of resources uh, that were expended on this project. So, a little fundamental essence of what I'm talking about here. Data is data. Your OPAC is nothing special. Your OPAC is just a database-driven website, like every other website in the world. It is the ILS and standard database-driven website infrastructures are identical. You have content which resides in linked data tables. Queries cause appropriate content to be assembled. And style sheets and what are called views define how content will be displayed. And the differences between OPACs and other websites, between Amazon.com or WhiteHouse.gov, these are deliberate design choices. OPACs are the way they are because someone chose to make them that way. Now with a database-driven website, you have the, uh, the concept of enter one, display many. You enter, con you enter your data in one place, and depending on how you have tagged it and defined it, it will go to where it needs to go, where you have told data of that kind to present itself. And the same infrastructure, the same compute, computing architecture can support your familiar, friendly old bibliographic records. Regular old web pages saying what your hours are or where the bathrooms are or profiles of various librarians or whatever you think belongs on a website. And it can also, that same data core can drive apps for tablets and smartphones. It can present multimedia. It can drive RSS feeds, static and dynamic RSS. And it can be converted into XML for easy data sharing. And that's the same, the same content can be doing all of those things simultaneously. So here's an example, uh, purely um, purely theoretical. So you create an, a master record for an online resource and um, it, you say it's in the bibliographic item format so the system knows that it's not a web page saying where the restrooms are and you assign a taxonomy and taxonomy within a database driven website is extremely powerful. It, it creates menus. It, it creates automatically generated nested menus. It creates, it brings like items together. It is, it can be, you can use a taxonomy to define the organizational principles of your website. And it isn't just a bunch of keywords to be found in a search. And the web display. You can display 
this content in as many ways as you like. This, by the way, is an example of one of those RAND publications being presented as web content uh, because of that uh, project I talked about a little earlier. And you can use this same content within your website, within your OPAC, within, uh, you, but you can also pull in and blend it with content from the cloud uh, from uh, and add web 2.0 features or whatever you think belongs in a web page can go in a web page and it is not limited to, to traditional catalog record content. Anything that, is, that can go on a web page should be able to go on a web page containing ILS content. You can also use it to generate, and we librarians love to generate lists of recommended resources. So for example, if you, ta if you tag that thing as core health list, um, it, could it could then immediately add itself to a menu of core health resources that can appear in an infinite number of places around your web presence. And it can also be simultaneously syndicated. This is RSS. This is what, it, what, what the code looks like. And it can also easily export as XML, all simultaneously with the same data. Because you have the single data source, when you need to change something, you change it in the one place. And the changes flow out to wherever they need to go. And this is bibliographic content. This is uh, information on accessing resources. It is tools to, to uh, uh, it is essentially anything you enter as content can go as many places as it likes and be changed centrally from the core, um, the core record. You can also search it in multiple ways. Um, you can continue to search it with your core search engine, the familiar Boolean-driven library search tool that, uh, that we are so comfortable with. Uh, but it can also be searchable by any other tool, by internal intranet search engines, by Google, by anything else, because it is being presented as web pages and is, um, it is something that the search tools of the web know how to deal with. Now, this was actually addressed to ILS vendors. I don't know that there are any out there, uh, but I did, in fact, give this uh, to the, uh, the annual meeting of an ILS vendor, and I was very uh, gratified that they um, felt it was useful to hear it. But if you are a vendor, your competition is not other ILS vendors. It's everyone else. It is content management systems like Drupal. It's also, the, there are vendors out there that are trying to talk you out of even having an ILS and using, and using their resources on the cloud. There are, there are a lot of different options out there available that are not the ILS and that might in fact be more flexible and more cost effective. Um, as I said, this example is Drupal, of which, with which I'm very familiar, having deployed several websites using it. It's a very widely used uh, open source content management system. The White, Whitehouse.gov uses it, among many others. It allows for multiple authors, for varied and rich web content, and it even includes modules that mimic an ILS. They have a Mark uh, import and display module. They have XML import and export tools. They can do full text and faceted searching of the, of the content. But the one tool, the one uh, it handles your entire web presence. Everything you do on the web is driven by this one tool that is taxonomy driven. And it, it, is, a, it is a very powerful um, web creation tool, but what it doesn't have is good circulation, acquisition, and journal management elements. Those are very primitive and more or less patched together. 
But the question that we all need to be asking then is, are those additional features worth however many thousands of dollars a year we are paying for them? Okay, I will open myself up to, uh, uh, to questions again, um, but uh, I will be addressing the futures of libraries and librarianship in my next bit. Any, uh, any new questions? Yes, Walter, there are a couple of questions. The first one is rather long. Um, I'll, try to <clears throat> I'll read it and see if, if this makes sense for you. Are you aware of examples where the resources for knowledge management were available, say in the CMS or CRM, and the library played a vital role in KM by abandoning the library standards that may have been underutilized anyway? especially if the data can only be used once exported and made contextually relevant. Okay, the, unfortunately the only, um, the only example I'm aware of where this is happening has been Boeing. Um, and, they, and, and my knowledge of what's there is based primarily on their presentation and um, and a discussion afterwards with, uh, with their librarians. Um, but it was definitely a case of, um, of abandoning the MARC standard, certainly. Uh, they maintain, uh, they, they created new uh, standards. And this is, in fact, something we are in the process of doing here at RAND. Uh, we have found ourselves very much in the knowledge management business uh, by default. Um, because of that there is a demand for uh, someone to organize our, um, our research legacy um, and there's no one else to do it and we are fortunately uh, in a position to do that. Um, but we are actually currently at the stage of figuring out what those standards are. We are early on in the process, um, but uh, we are having to create uh, new um, new standards on the fly, the key being that, uh, that they, they, they need to be consistent and relevant, um, but they are not MARC, they are not Dublin Core. Um, I think that's, base, that's really all I can, I've got to address that specifically. Is there a second question? There is another question, but isn't a circulation module a necessity for most libraries rather than an additional feature of an ILS? Uh, it, it is a, an essential feature of a library that is, that is uh, built around circulating physical objects. And that, again, is, a, is an area where, um, where, you, where you sit has a lot to do with it. Uh, in the corporate world, that requirement is fading away. And um, what I would suggest is that um, you wouldn't necessarily, if you were to uh, use a different way of tracking your content, um, uh, if, if you were to use a different way of, tra uh, tracking your, uh, of, of uh, retrieving your content, you could use something less sophisticated, something that doesn't have auto-generated overdue, multiple overdue notices that say, you know, first warning, second warning, you know, the things that, that your uh, circulation systems do. You don't necessarily need all that. Um, and I think you will find that the, that the trend is, is, is away from that of keeping track of who has the physical thing. Uh, so, yeah, my question would be how much circulation do you need? And you should ask yourself that. I don't have an answer, but I think you might ask yourself that and then find um, that you don't need all the circulation that your ILS has given you. And one more question. What ILS does RAND use, and do you think that Google will get involved in the ILS business? Uh, the RAND Corporation used to use Circe. Uh, but uh, we were dissatisfied with uh, its growth model. Uh, we are now using EOS, uh, which um, is in, in many, it's a much cheaper system. It doesn't do a lot of things that uh, Cersei did 
in terms of acquisition, serials control, circulation, and so forth. But it is actually uh, more flexible, and we are we are having a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, useful uh, growth with them. But I also I don't want to get too much into being brand specific uh, because there are other you know I don't want to diss Sydney or even diss Cersei uh, out because that's that's I'm really uh, talking about thinking about the ILS differently. Um, I can, are we ready to move on? Um, I think we should move on and then we, we will take what um, the next uh, bunch of questions at your next break. Right. The, the next break will in fact be the end. All right. Well, there's one more. Let's do this okay. one more and then see what happens. Sure. How do you handle your licensed e-resources, e-journal articles, e-books? Um, the the uh, person asking the question says we have millions of those. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Um, yeah, we we uh, we make use of serial solutions um, in a in a uh, um, in a vain attempt to try to keep uh, track of it all. Um, and that's one of the things about uh, um, the ILS is that uh, I think uh, I mean that's a third party solution, and I think the future of a good ILS is as working and playing well with third-party solutions. Um, now, Serial Solutions has its own issues, but the whole uh, challenge of, of, of accessing uh, licensed content, uh, is, it's, it's rapidly changing, and it's one where the, where the ILS and the OPEC are actually more or less sitting back and watching. And about all they can do is import content and link to content, um, and perhaps provide a search box for your federated tool but there, there's probably better ways to do it. Um, I don't know necessarily what those are, but I don't think that the ILS, as it's currently configured, is really set up to do that. Um, okay, and I guess we'll be moving on. All right, Walter, thanks. We'll continue okay. with your presentation. All righty. The, the world of tomorrow today. Um, the world, the whole sense of what libraries are and what librarians are is changing. Now, the old organizing principle evolved for a very good reason. The traditional libraries evolved because information resided in books. And if you brought lots of books together in one place, you created this powerful symbiosis. And you, of course, you needed catalogers to organize all those books, and then you needed librarians to find the information in the books uh, to, and to help others find it. And in order for this, this model to work properly, you all had to be in the same place. The books and the people needed to be together. This doesn't apply anymore. The reference librarian, the public service librarian, uh, the person who, who finds stuff for people and helps others find it, um, they, they're finding a tiny and ever-shrinking proportion of what they use, to, the information resources they use, are actually owned by their own library and cataloged by that library. They essentially, the, 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 the ILS content is becoming a very small part of what they do. And it's not, the collection isn't a thing inside the library's walls, and it isn't cataloged by your catalogers. It's, it's in a thousand different places. It is, as that uh, questioner mentioned, there's, there's thousands of things out there, and it's a mess. But it's not being managed by your catalogers. It's being cataloged by a thousand strangers. And that cataloger down the hall from you, she contributes very little to what you do every day. Now, if you're a cataloger, you may very well be cataloging for a far wider audience than your own library. You might be one of thousands of catalogers who are contributing pieces to this vast information landscape. And unless you're, a, unless you're a copy cataloger who's merely importing stuff into your ILS, 
uh, and I think your days may be numbered. But you, the cataloger, your skills are applicable to activities that have nothing to do with libraries. Everyone out there needs good metadata and, and well-conceived taxonomies. And if you are a cataloger of the new school, you have a lot to contribute to people who may not, in fact, be libraries. So we have a new dynamic. The reference librarian doesn't need to inhabit a library because that's not where the information is. And a cataloger doesn't need to inhabit a place called library because the audience for her work is networked and global. The cataloging and reference, of course, are very, very different skill sets that attract very different kinds of people. And their relationship, as I, I've laid out, is very much in flux. So when a library as a place or as an organizing principle persists, it's either out of inertia, because, well, we've always done it that way, or it's for reasons other than those that originally brought catalogers and reference librarians together. So, in the new world, cataloging is consortial, it's global, it's cloud-based, reference is local, it's personal, it's one-on-one -on -one with the customer, and it's client-driven. It is reliant, however, on those very same consortial, global, cloud-based content sources. Local physical collections are shrinking in importance, and even the physical collections are becoming consortial. You, there, you go to WorldCat and you can find out that in fact the library in the next town has the book you need. The collection that matters is accessed but not owned by you, and you didn't catalog it. So, where is the ILS going? The traditional ILS that sits down in your digital basement and has its whimsical name is based on a traditional library. And the traditional library is fading away and a, so will the traditional ILS. So, let us glimpse into the future. The catalog in the cloud, the pervasive consortial cataloging is going to build massive virtual collections. It already is, WorldCat being an excellent example. And one thing that I predict will quickly disappear is you will stop importing data into your ILS. You'll access it where it lives in its central repository because the data out there on the cloud should obey the same data management law as your database driven website. You should enter once and it should go where it needs to go. And when you change it, it, go, it changes where it needs to go. And if, if your model is to clone, make thousands and thousands of clones of data as it exists at any given moment and put that into your catalog, you are guaranteed to have out of date data. Um, and simultaneously, your unique contributions flow out to the cloud, and your portal is your your OPAC is your portal to the cloud. But then, so I'm talking about a new path for librarians: knowledge management, metadata, and taxonomy. Um, and for online retailers, universities, and the like, not just libraries, and web technology, a better understanding of that. And the library community and the ILS can embrace this, and it can lead to an, this new discipline, or it can concede it to others. So the ILS becomes a content management system. It becomes a, con, a complete database-driven website with flexible metadata templates for many types of non-traditional content, and it's open to external search, and one interface creates all types of web content and it focuses on a wide-ranging integration, the catalog in the cloud, data feeds, web search, vendor databases, and all of that. And it's not inward-facing, and it's optimized for easy data coming and outgoing. And the, li the library content manager, um, most organizations, I know RAN needs 
effective content management and they haven't found it yet. If the ILS were an effective content management system and not just a card catalog analog, we could leverage that to become viable competitors in the information marketplace. Library information uh, knowledge managers could come to the table with a really robust, capable system already in place that would offer a viable alternative to chaotic Drupal-type open source and these multi-zillion dollar proprietary KM systems. And if the ILS doesn't do that, then we need to ditch the ILS and hitch our car to a better mule. Now, why would ILS content management be cool? Because most content management systems are inwardly facing. They're all about the organization keeping track of its stuff, and they're not about blending internal and external data and presenting it in a seamless manner. And that's something librarians who understand the greater world of information could bring to content management. So, my list of demands. Set my data free. There's exquisitely crafted data out there and it's trapped in an obscure part of the web. What we need to do is present data in multiple ways, in multiple places, multiple formats, share it easily with the website and the cloud and let it go where it needs to go. We need to focus on strong standards and consistent quality, otherwise we've got no role in this at all if we can't do it better than everyone else. Set our interface free. OPAC designers are never as good at interface design as the current state of the art because, of course, all those interface improvements are upgrades. Um, and they're in the queue behind all the things we demand that those ILS vendors do for us. And they need to open this up to other people. They need to let people who are better at it than they, am, than they are manage their interface and they could then blend the OPAC, the website, they could encourage open source style template sharing among customers, make it more Web 2.0 compatible. We need to set the architecture free. It's rigidly focused on bibliographic management. It needs to be about CMS, uh, content management, and it needs, needs to use, um, uh, it needs to be flexible and easily customized and use taxonomies for site-wide organization management. And the search needs to be free. We need to be able to look at our content with multiple types of search tools depending on what we need to do. And we need to be able to blend internal and external content, um, vendor, cloud data, and so forth into a single interface. And why is the ILS the way it is? It's because vendors give us what we ask for. We, the customers, are stuck in an obsolete mindset. And we need to wake up and start demanding things that are relevant, or we and the vendors are, will meet the same sorry fate. So vendors, you need to make it easy for us. Uh, everything that I've talked about is possible and is being done now. All we need to do is hack your system. And all that requires is vast resources and technical expertise. Unfortunately, these software as a service, SaaS um, and cloud installations are harder to hack and harder to repurpose. You need to provide flexible, easy to use CMS and data integration out of the box or we'll have the geek gap. We already have the geek gap. Libraries with coders and API programmers evolve and thrive and under-resourced libraries, most of us, will stagnate and die. And of course, ILS vendors, the geeks will probably decide they don't need you. However, um, in, an alter, in alternate universes, you can have your cake and eat it too. Because you can have it all. You can present content in all of these other ways, but you can still have your good old OPAC. Because multiple views and multiple templates can be applied to the same data. You can search your content with new tools, but it doesn't stop you from also searching it with old librarian-friendly Boolean tools. And your old buddy, the OPAC, with its amusing name, like Catnip, the catalog of the New York Public Library, uh, can be accessible while at the same time going around through the great data world, going where it needs to go. So one last parting shot here. I'm not talking about anything new here. No new technologies. I am talking about new ways of thinking about the ILS 
that makes full use of current technology. The ILS needs to evolve, it needs to become flexible, malleable, and up-to-date. It has to provide a full range of content management tools. It must make interaction with the greater world a focus and not an afterthought, a thing they do at when they've, they've done everything else. And it must facilitate user-initiated experimentation and innovation. And I'm not necessarily talking about having them change the base code but if it were a more flexible system with a taxonomy driven, there are many things that will suggest themselves over time, new ways of approaching problems and that don't necessarily require the system to be reprogrammed, just looked at in a different way. And we need to evolve. We need to embrace new ways of thinking about and managing information. We need to move beyond the, the, the card catalog mentality. We can't afford to be sentimental if it doesn't meet our needs, be it an ILS, be it a tool, be it an assumption or a mindset, it must be cast aside. And the final question, does the librarian of tomorrow need an integrated library system? And now, I guess I can open up to final questions. Well, Walter, thank you. There is one more question at the moment. We'll see if a few more come in, and then um, we'll do our conclusion. So let me read you the, the question that is available now. You earlier mentioned that an ILS is simply a database in the back end. My ILS allows me to create completely new tables, fields, and a web interface to match just as you described. Could you expand on how one may be can maybe design direct access to that common database to basically create the fully integrated resource management system. <laughs> that, I, that, that, that is one of those things I have to sit down, look at the system that, that they're talking about, and, and figure out what applies in that case. I don't think I could, within a minute or two, uh, give a meaningful answer to would you um, try to answer that offline in, in, written, in some form of written um, I would be happy way? to. And then we can send that out when we send out our answers. So that there is another, OK, great. There is another question, um, actually a couple more. So is integrated functionality versus an integrated system what the librarian of the future needs? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 well, the ability to integrate um, to, to integrate seamlessly outside itself, I guess if that's what uh, what is meant by, by in there by integrated functionality, yes. All right. Next question: How do we convince our decision makers and users that metadata taxonomy cataloger and personal support reference are important and valuable when the new cloud-based systems look easy to manage and access without librarians? Well, that's what I was talking about. You need you, uh, you, it's the uh, the value proposition, and it was it really boils to, and um, I and I guess the core of this presentation is that the ILS can either help or hinder that. If the ILS allows you to come to the table with a powerful tool um, that uh, um, it essentially is already in place, you know a a, a, um, a, an already functioning and already understood known quantity, and you can sit down and say, this tool we have, we librarians have as our flagship product, this can be, uh, you, this can answer your needs. Um, if you can do that, then, the, then you and the ILS can make an argument for yourselves. If you can't, if, if the ILS doesn't do that, then you're stuck trying very hard to make the observation that you can do a more efficient job of finding quality information. Now, a lot of this has to do with your corporate culture. Um, it, when an, an organization like mine, the RAND Corporation, where um, intellectual rigor and clear uh, documentation is essential, we, are, we in the library are pretty safe because we have reference librarians who are um, who, who have a proven track record in providing good bibliographic research 
Um, and we also have a, uh, a, a, a taxonomy staff with a proven track record in supporting the taxonomy needs of the internal website and that has been and the external website and and it has been a case of us being given an opportunity and then meeting that challenge uh, within RAND that has made us at least for the moment pretty secure um, but every organization is going to have different challenges and different needs and there may well you know there might be a situation in a corporate organizational culture where in fact the library cannot make a viable value proposition um, and really it boils down to the needs of your customers. One more question Walter. How do you see the mark replacement that is currently in development as playing into your future of the ILS? I think it is a small piece um, because I think I think um, all bibliographic formatting is, I think, well, I think it's, well, I, I'm, I'm a big non-fan of MARC, and I think anything we can do to make MARC more efficient and better and more consistent with, with, uh, with uh, data management practices, I'm all for that. But the, the thing about it is I don't think MARC in any form is the answer, because I think that we need to be um, thinking well beyond that kind of data. We need to be thinking about content and knowledge management that moves beyond the analog of the catalog card and focuses upon, focuses on, on, um, uh, on, on presenting your data in such a way that the client that it that the client can find it and understand it, and this data may in fact not be bibliographic at all. Uh, it could be any number of things. So I think Mark uh, improved Mark is good. I think it is a small piece of a very big picture. Thank you. That was the last question. Um, the one that you will answer in writing is on our question log, which you will receive. And now we will conclude our program. Very good. Well, thank you, Walter, for your very interesting assessment on the future of the integrated library system. And thanks to you, our attendees, for joining us this afternoon. You will receive a short online evaluation form about today's webinar. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and return it to us. Your comments and suggestions are taken seriously and help the Alex Continuing Education Committee to plan future continuing education offerings. If you have an idea for a webinar, please submit a proposal using the online form found on the Alex website. Alex offers an array of online learning opportunities. In addition to the full schedule of 2012 fall and winter webinars, which you see on the screen, four weeks duration web-based course, web courses on a variety of subjects are offered regularly. The CE Committee also schedules e-forums on a monthly basis that have become very popular. Alex members, as well as non-members, are welcome to participate in these forums. Please visit the Alex website for details about all our continuing education offerings. As we conclude this afternoon's broadcast, I would like to thank Amy Lana and Felicity Dykus, members of the CE Committee's Technical Support Subcommittee, as well as Alyssa Novak in the Alex office for their assistance. And thank you, Pamela, for co-hosting this webinar. Once again, on behalf of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee, I would like to express our appreciation to all present here today. We hope that this webinar has been of interest to each of you and look forward to welcoming you at another ELEX webinar in the future.